I'm going to pray uh, once more uh, that the Lord would be with us uh, this time in the Word. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to hear from you in your Word. Uh, God, we thank you that we have ways with technology to still be able to have this time together, God, and we pray um, that you would push us to prayer, that you would push us to trust you, push us to honor you, and we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, as uh, as Brian just alluded to, um, I have changed the text that I'm that I'm preaching from. I was going to um, preach from Second uh, Corinthians chapter one, uh, titled "Just Do Something." Instead, we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter four, um, verses six to seven. I'll go ahead and read those, and then we'll we'll, we'll dive in. Philippians chapter four, starting at verse six. The guy's word says this: "Do not be anxious about anything." But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's God's word. Um, I'll I'll start off by, you know, one, I'll start off by saying this is a little strange. Never just preached a whole sermon into the screen like this, but I'm I'm praying it will still bless you. Uh, wherever you are, uh, I, I pray that God's work is still grab a hold of you. Um, when me and my family, and we just said in that little kitchen talk, me and my family uh, moved back to Dallas uh, about two years ago. And so obviously one of the first things you do when you move somewhere new is you find a place to live. And so we were obviously looking for a new home. And one of the things that was important to me once we actually got in the house and I was keeping a close eye on was the thermostat. And I know that sounds silly, but the thermostat and how well it keeps your house the right temperature is one of those things that you can't really test in an open house or in an inspection. You you just don't know for sure. Um, And all is good. It works well. Um, And what it means that it works well is that the temperature inside my house looks like what I set it at on the thermostat, right? That Even if it's hot outside, it can still be cool inside. Even if it's cold outside, it stays the same inside. Uh, it was stable. Uh, and the reason that that was something that I was really trying to figure out is because my old house uh, that I lived in was susceptible to, you know, changing climates on the outside. So it would be fine. It would feel nice when the weather was mild. But when it got really hot, then my uh, AC couldn't keep up. When it got too cold, my heat couldn't keep up. Um, and that's the opposite of what a, a thermostat is supposed to do. It's supposed to keep a temperature no matter what's happening on the outside. Um And thinking about that also makes me think about our souls. Um, What we don't want is we do not want the kind of soul that is only in good shape when the climate around us is moderate, like my old house was. You want the kind of soul that's in good shape no matter what's going on outside or inside. A soul that's at peace no matter what comes your way because we know there's always going to be a lot of crazy stuff coming our way. Um, And one of the things I want to focus on as we look at this text is anxiety uh, and how that should push us to pray. We want a soul that's at peace no matter what comes our way. And you may just want to ask me, but how is that even possible to to have a soul at peace when we live in a really stressful world? Um, And especially right now where everything is stressful because everything is just strange. That means work life or school life or home life or health. Right. This is a unique season. A couple months ago, probably the people with the most work stress was people who worked at Popeye's and just trying to deal with all the people trying to beat down the doors for a chicken sandwich. It's crazy how life can change in a couple months because with this virus just shutting everything down, everybody has work stress um, and everyone's trying to figure this out. But even if we just think of life outside of this virus, and I know there's probably ways that it's impacted your life, ways that you know, I may not even understand. Um, But even outside of that, life is still stressful. So, you know, if if, when this season ends, life is still going to be stressful after that, even if it's just trying to reach your goals or figuring out what life is like after we reach our goals. Stress is really hard to avoid. Peace feels really hard to come by. So here's what this means for us. For us to have a peace that really matters, it has to be a special kind of peace, right? Because if we have a, a flimsy, fragile kind of peace, then that peace will act like a flimsy, fragile kind of peace. When things get hard, things get rocky, then that peace is going to disappear. And what we need, especially for a season like this, is an enduring peace, a peace that comes from God himself. So how do we, how do we get that peace? 
is not by just looking at all our burdens and just trying to handle them on our own. We 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 uh, achieve that peace by giving those burdens to someone else who can handle. Them. Here's what I think the main point of this passage I just read is. Um, I think the main thing I want you to walk away with, if you only walk away with one thing, is this. Give your burdens to God and he'll give his peace to you. Give your burdens to God and he will give his peace to you. Um, in the book of Philippians, I'm not sure if you've ever read it. It's a good book. It's one of those short books, too, that you can read in a short amount of time. You can read it just on an afternoon. It's only a few chapters. Um, where we are in chapter four, which is the last chapter um, you know, Paul has laid out these beautiful truths about the gospel. He's called them the ways they're supposed to live among one another, you know. And if you think when you hear this, um, if you think that you're dealing with some stress in your life, you should think about what the Philippian church was dealing with, with all the uh, things that come along with being a new church community, with the persecution. Um, and even the thing about what Paul the apostle was dealing with, right? Because he was writing this from prison. He was not somewhere in a Starbucks with his feet kicked up writing this letter. He was writing from prison, um, jailed for the gospel, and he's still able to write about how the gospel is, uh, is so powerful. And so Paul has credibility to speak to us this morning about what to do with our, uh, speak to us this afternoon uh, about what to do with our uh, stress and anxiety and, and how to go after peace. And so in verses one to six, when he's talking, he's encouraging them to have peace with each other. He's just saying, I want y'all to have the same mind. Um, it helps the cause of the gospel. And then he tells us in, in those verses um, that we just read that if we give our burdens to God, God will give us his peace. So what do I mean when I say give your burdens to God? That's one of those things that could just sound like a, a, uh, a nice churchy thing that a pastor might say. What does it actually mean? I'll talk about that in three points, what it means to give your burdens to God. Number one is let them go. Number one is let them go. And I worded it that way because the question that we're wondering is not whether or not stresses and anxieties will come our way. The question is, what will we do with the stresses and anxieties that come our way? Letting go of the stresses and anxiety sounds tough, but we can't just rationalize and normalize all our stress and anxiety. It's not a good way to live. There's been a bunch of recent studies and surveys that have been done. And what they're saying is that right now we are uh, in what they're calling an anxiety epidemic, right? This is pre all the stuff that's happening with this virus. They're saying there's been this dramatic spike in the percentage of Americans who, who say they have stress and anxiety of all kinds. Um, and this is even more so for teens and young adults. Um, so we could talk about why we're so stressed and all of that. But the question is, what are you going to do when that stress comes your way? We will have to deal with it. But we shouldn't assume that when that stress and anxiety shows up, that we just got to live with it. We, we shouldn't assume that we just have to accept it as just something we always will have. Paul is telling us something different and treats it like we have a choice. So verse six, again, he says, do not be anxious about anything. Verse six says, do not be anxious about anything. And that is, uh, that is a, a, a big thing to say. Anything, right? That sounds hard to do. Um, there was one author who I think said it helpfully where he said, you know, him saying, don't worry or don't be anxious. That's both a command and an invitation, right? It is a command for us to do, but it's also an invitation to a better way to live. Think about uh, a life without any worry or anxiety. Just think about what that would be like. Doesn't that sound amazing? Right? The Greek word here for, for anxious that he uses when he says don't be anxious about anything, that Greek word uh, means anxious, right? It means just what it sounds like. We know what that means. Uh, to be anxious is to worry, to be deeply concerned about something, to be consumed, overwhelmed by our circumstances. And sometimes it's just one thing in particular, something that happened in your day or something that's going on in your life. And sometimes it's just this general sense of uh, of stress and weight on you. I want you to imagine, though, how much joy you would have if you were not weighed down with anxiety. Anxiety is, it's a poison that kills everything. It sniffs out our joy and it suffocates it. But Paul's saying we don't have to be weighed down by it. Now, I know some of y'all hear that and you think I'm saying ignore your problems. This is not a call to ignore your problems and the stuff that makes you stress. And here's part of why, because ignoring your problems is just setting a bomb to go off at a later date. That's not what he's telling us to. He's, he, he's trying to help us think through how to deal with them. So we shouldn't minimize the impact of stress 
or how we deal with it. Listen to what Jesus says in uh, Matthew chapter six. Matthew six, Jesus says this, starting in verse 27. He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Jesus asked an amazing question to us here when we were worrying. He says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Right. Does, does worrying ever actually do something? Who's ever been able to solve a situation just by worrying about? Now, worrying may have made you do something to solve it, but the worrying itself doesn't solve anything. Sometimes we find ourselves having so much anxiety because we'll take an issue, we'll turn it over in our mind, and we'll just take it to its scariest possible end. You ever had somebody, um, a friend, maybe a boss, be like, hey, I need to talk to you about something. You're like, well, what is it? I was like, no, I'll talk to you about it later. And then you spend the whole day uh, coming up with all these crazy doomsday scenarios. Right. If it's your friend, you're like, man, I bet it's about that one time I didn't text him back. And I bet he probably called my professors and got me to fail. Right. And I'm going to end up homeless by next year. It's like, why are you going so far? Um, this is not a healthy thought life. Right. So we wrestle with stress because we just turn these issues over in our mind. And the only thing that accomplishes is making us more stressed. But Jesus gives us an alternative here right here. He says to seek his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus is calling us to action, but that action is not worry. And some of us would do better at, um, you know, seeking his kingdom instead of uh, worrying and being anxious. Um, if we had friends who helped us to do that. Some of us are stressed out because we only hang out with stressed out people. Your mom is stressed, your little brother is stressed, uh, all your friends are stressed. Sometimes we need some new friends, right? Have you ever uh, been around a peaceful person who just is able to see things as they are and it's not so rocky up and down with everything that happens? It just makes you want to be that way and we can learn from them. And because we're in such stressful environments, uh, it, it makes it seem impossible to do what, what he's calling us to. Another reason we're stressed sometimes is because we have a low view of God's sovereignty and overall rule over everything. Um, because anxiety um, is one of those things that, and worrying about something, it's almost like um, revenge where God says vengeance is mine, but we try to get it for ourselves. But anxiety and worrying is, is one of those things where we don't trust God to be God, so we try to take his role from him. But uh, our part is not to, to worry about every detail. He's called us to specific things, and then we have to trust him with the rest. Because sometimes we think that God is really powerful, but he's not all powerful, that God has control, but not really, just a little bit. Um, and this world is kind of just spinning and he can intervene when he needs to, but he's not controlling everything. But no, no, God is absolutely sovereign. He never loses control. He doesn't have to intervene if he's in control. God, when something goes wrong, God doesn't need to take back the reins, right? He doesn't lose control. Now that doesn't mean that we don't have choices, right? Or that God condones what everyone's always doing, but it does mean that Everything is in his hands. So, so even in a season like this, it's crazy for us to act like the sky is falling when we know that even the sky is in God's hands. It's his. So we act as if our trials are stronger, to, stronger than God when they are not. Can you imagine um, if um, like LeBron James' son was worried about where he was going to get his next meal? Wouldn't that be strange? That would be really strange, and, and here's part of why, because your dad is a very wealthy person. Y'all got what you need, right? Um, and in the same way, our, our father has far more. So then when Paul tells us, don't be anxious about anything, one of the way, reasons that we don't have to be is because not only is our God in control, but he's also a God who, who, uh, who owns everything, right? He, he has a crazy amount of resources. Remembering who God is changes the way we look at the stuff that worries us. And you may say, but Tripp, that may work for your little problems, but you don't know what I'm dealing with. 
But again, Paul says, don't be anxious about anything. So that means don't be anxious about your finances, which is one of the hardest areas, right? Especially in a season like this when so much feels up in the air. He says, don't be anxious about your health. Hard in a season like this. Now, that doesn't mean that those things don't matter. It just means don't let that dread overwhelm you. Um, uh, anxiety is different than planning well or being wise. Uh, it's different than giving it the proper attention. It's giving it attention that doesn't do anything, and it's not what God has called us to, right? So we should let, let them go. We should let our worries go, which, again, sounds nice. How do we do that? Uh, number two, we should do it with our burdens. We should hand them off. Number two, we should hand them off. Um, one thing that... Um, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist with my work life, um, especially with music projects stuff I'm working on. Um, but, but this shows up in everything I do. I just want it to be right. And so what that'll mean sometimes is that, uh, I want to do a lot of things myself because I like how I do it, which is dumb because sometimes it's dumb because I, I don't even do them right all the time. But one of the best things that I can do as a leader or even an artist is to delegate, to not try to carry all the load by myself, especially when it's too much for me. Well, God has called us not to try to act like we can handle all our worries by ourselves and to just ignore them. He's saying you, you should hand them over. But instead of handing them over to another person who might make their own mistakes, he's saying hand them to me. I'm perfect. Um, we get to hand them over to an all perfect God. Verse six, I'll read it again. He says, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. That is the action that we're to take right there. We are to present these to God. That's how we hand them over, by presenting our requests about them to God. And you might say, I don't want to be fake and act like hard times aren't hard. This is the kind of fakeness that turns people off from following Jesus. But the opposite of worry is not ignoring your problems. It is giving them to God. The opposite of worry. It's not ignoring your problems. It's giving them to God. It's handing them off. I wonder if you've ever seen kids try to act strong. Uh, my son loves the idea of being strong. And sometimes he'll want to help carry heavy stuff. Like when my wife brings groceries home and, you know, he wants to grab stuff too. And he'll be like, oh, daddy, let me get the, let me get this bag. And I'm like, I don't think you should do that. And he's like, no, I got it. And he picks it up and then his whole body falls because he's not strong. So if that thing's going to get in the house, he has to hand it to me, an actual adult man who can carry. And in the same way, um, God is saying we should hand things over to him who's strong enough. And how do we do that? The main way is prayer, by making our request known to him, which may sound crazy, but if it does, it's because we forget what prayer actually is. Prayer is not just saying some words at the ceiling. Prayer is the act of handing our burdens over to Jesus because he's strong and he can take care of. And he asks us for him. He asks us for him. Think about how amazing our Savior is. That not only will he tolerate us bringing our burdens to him, he asks for him. He wants them. He's saying, those are mine. Give them to me. First Peter 5, 7, Peter says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Jesus is saying, those anxieties, those burdens, those are mine to deal with. They're not yours. Hand them to me. So then for us not praying or, or not calling on God in a time of stress is just foolish, right? It would be like not calling the police when your house is being robbed, right? You, you would say, man, why didn't you at least file a, a police report? Why would you not call on the ones who can do something to help you? The, the ones who said they, they're going to come to your aid. Now, I, what I don't want you to hear me saying is that if you are a person that's stressed and you got a lot of anxiety, um, it's because you, it's definitely because you don't pray enough. I'm not saying that, but it might be because you don't pray enough. Because when we pray, and it's not just the act of prayer either; it's the posture that goes with it. Because right, you can you can close your eyes and say words without having any faith in your heart. But when we actually trust God and we hand things over to Him, we, we're not anxious because that weight has been lifted off our back. We now know, okay, this is no longer mine to carry. I've actually given it to Him. And that frees us up to focus on what we have actually been called to do. We have not been called to hold the whole world in our hands. Maybe we've just been called to do our job with our whole heart. Maybe we've just been called to keep discipline in our children. Maybe we've just been called to turn in our schoolwork on time. Maybe we've just been called to love our neighbor. Um, but we can put the burdens on him. He gives us three words here for, for what it looks like to present things to God. Um, 
Uh, he brings up three things. The, 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 there's overlap in these words, too. One is prayer, which means intercession for others. It's an intercession. And one of my questions about your prayer life is, do you ever even pray for other people? Do other people ever come up when you talk to God, or are you the only person who's ever on your prayer list? Um, we should be going to God for other people. Uh, that, that other passage I was thinking about preaching, 2 Corinthians 1, he's thanking the Corinthians for helping him by prayer. Sometimes we think the opposite of doing something is just praying about it, like, oh, thoughts and prayers. God says that praying is doing something about it. And Paul says, thank you for your help by praying. Sometimes things are out of our hands and we actually can't help a person anymore, but we can pray to the God who can. He says prayers. He says petitions. Uh, a petition is uh, an urgent request to meet a need, right? So, so it's, it's an urgent request. And then I really need something. I need to be delivered. Uh, scripture says, uh, God says, call upon me in a day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. We want to bring those petitions to God. And he says requests. It's like naming specific items. I wonder, do you pray for specific things? Some of us, we like to pray and we just like to, God, you're so good. Thanks. Amen. Uh, God wants us to bring specific things to him. God wants us to pray for that situation at work where that coworker is getting on our nerves. God wants us to pray about whether or not our job is going to be waiting for us when we come back. God wants us to pray about when our kids are driving us crazy. We're wondering, is this kid always going to be like this or is this a stage? Give me the strength to deal with this. God wants us to bring those things to him. And somebody may say, if God is so sovereign and he knows everything, why would I bring it to him? Well, look, God doesn't need us to ask him, but he loves to do things in response to us asking him, right? That one time Jesus tells that story of the woman who keeps banging on the, the, the door of the judge and eventually the judge opens the door and Jesus is like, if even this judge, who's an evil person, um, will respond when it's repeatedly asked, how much more your father in heaven? He's saying, you should keep praying. You should keep bringing those things to God. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But he also says that we should present our request to God with thanksgiving. Now you may say, "Why? what does thanksgiving have to do with my peace? That kind of peace uh, that's being talked about. And it's because thanksgiving is a core part of prayer. Scripture always is mentioning thanksgiving alongside prayer. Uh, for example, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, he says, pray continually or without ceasing, ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances. So when we go before God with prayer and petition, we should do that with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is, uh, it's like a, a, a way to express the gratitude in our heart. And we have to approach God with gratitude and not entitlement. We should never go to God without saying thank you. Right, because even in the most stressful situations, there's still more than enough for us to thank God for. Um, my kids are uh, seven and five, and when we pray every night, I ask them for I say, "What do you want to thank God for? What do you want to ask God for?" Because not only do we need to be asking God for things and praising Him for who He is, we also need to be thanking Him for what He's done. A heart that uh, is asking God for stuff but never thanks Him for what they've given Him is not a heart that's prepared to receive what you've even asked for. It's like that entitled child who keeps asking for allowance, but never says thank you, right? Or that kid at Christmas who keeps asking what the rest of their presents are without saying thank you for the ones that they've already opened. Without Thanksgiving, we, we can't even see our situations well. I hope you understand that, you know, your lack of Thanksgiving for, for the things that God has given you is one of the causes of your stress, right? Because we can become anxious when we only ever give thought to all the stuff that's not going right. You ever caught yourself complaining about a bunch of stuff that's not right when you're in a good situation, uh, right? Like mad because you went to the grocery store and you forgot, or, or you know they forgot to, to put this in the bag. They forgot my water. I really need that water. It's like, bro, you just came home with a bunch of groceries. God has provided all of your needs. We're talking about one thing that you don't have. Um, you remember the story of the 10 lepers, but Jesus heals them, they go off, and one comes back praising God, and Jesus says, what's up with the other ones? Were they not also blessed? We, we should thank God and have this heart of thanksgiving, not entitlement. Entitlement is a friend of your worry, and it's an enemy of your peace. Entitlement, when, when you think you just deserve everything, that is going to lead you to a place of stress and worry, because you're always going to be confused when, we, when you don't get your way. Um, as the enemy of your peace. The more entitled our attitude is, the less at peace will be. This is how little kids live where they're always confused when things don't go their way. 
Um, we, we do that all kinds of ways in our hearts. One thing goes wrong, we grumble and complain all day. And if we don't do it out loud, we do it in our hearts. But we should thank God. We should have this, this heart of gratitude. And I'll confess that, you know, th- there have been seasons even recently where I felt convicted that, that I personally just haven't been praying enough about certain things. That there's some stuff that, that is stressful. Um, that have, When there's stuff that's, that's stressful and has been in our lives for a long time, the temptation is to just stop praying. Because there, there can just be a sneaky doubt that seeks in, wondering if God is really ever going to do anything. But when we look in the Gospels, we see Jesus continually encouraging us to keep bringing things to him, to keep bringing our burdens to him. So that even if he hasn't answered our prayers in the ways that we want to, we need to keep bringing those burdens to God. Because if we give God our burdens, he will give us his peace. Last, last thing, number three, we should do with our burdens. We should trade them in. We should trade them in. Um, there's a good trade-off happening here that God that God gives us. Um, when I was a, a little kid um, and, I, and I played video games, I was never very good, and I only played sports video games, Madden, NBA Live, you know, those kind of things. Um, but whenever I would uh, trade stuff in a GameStop, they would always, it'd be a game that I bought for however much it was, $25, $30, and they'd be like, oh, okay, here's 37 cents. It was like, bro, I bought it here last month. For this amount, it was always a bad trade-in. It was never a good trade-off. I never got something in return that was worth me even going to the trouble of bringing. Um, but here's, here's what is happening here. Verse 7, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This is a good trade-off, right? Giving God our burdens and our worries is a good trade-off because what we get back is this peace that transcends all understanding. This peace is not just an inner feeling good. It's not just an inner peace. It's a peace that shows up in our whole lives. It's going to show up in our relationships, show up in our community life with other believers, right? This is part of Paul's conversation with the Philippian church about their unity. The peace of God should show up in the life of their church and and, and in your churches too. Um, And he says that this peace transcends all understanding. And and I think he means that, that this peace isn't dependent on how much we understand that we can lack knowledge of why something's happening and how long it's going to happen, but still be at peace. And, and I just, you know, I need you to, uh, one thing we got to just grab a hold of is there will always be some lack of understanding about a situation. And if we can only be at peace when we know all the information, then we will never be at peace, right? Because to be human is to lack understanding. So we should be thankful that the peace God offers us, that the peace God offers you is a peace that transcends your understanding. Because otherwise, it would be a shaky piece, a piece that can only survive in a really specific kind of circumstance. And instead, God has given us an enduring piece, a, a versatile piece, an all-weather piece, a multi-purpose piece. Um, and he says it guards our minds. And, you know, this is, this is kind of military language. I want you to imagine military guards, people in charge of keeping people safe. It's a protection. This piece doesn't just make us feel better. It protects us. Right? So some of you are saying, trip. Praying and is not going to keep life from being chaotic. And I didn't say that. I said God has promised the peace he gives us will protect us in the midst of this chaotic world. It's going to guard us from, from the anxiety that threatens to weigh us down. And it's going to guard our relationships. It's going to guard our work life. And it's going to guard us in Christ Jesus. There's so much about life that's always going to be up and down. Money's going to be up and down. Friends are going to be up and down. Health is going to be up and down. Jobs going to be up and down. The only reason this peace is possible is because God is unmovable. Peace is only possible because God is unmovable. So while everything else is doing this up and down, God is perfectly steady. He's the rock of ages, and we can keep our eyes on him. Um, I'm I'm, I'm wrapping up. I I, I do want to give just a couple quick tips for peace that go alongside with our praying. Um, First one is this. You should look at your life because some of us are stressed because we organize our lives in stressful ways. Second thing, we should slow down. We got to make time for solitude and meditating on God's word. Otherwise, we won't have time to pray and give our burdens to God. Uh, Third thing, we want to give time to community, spending time with other people, right? You want to spend time with people of peace and invite those people into your life. That's what is counseling. Some of us have stress and anxiety that is going to be hard to work through on our own. Some of us have a kind of Stress. I've been talking about a kind of stress and anxiety um, that isn't a some kind of clinical depression 
right? Some of us need counseling to help us figure out and balance is going on in our in our uh, brains, right? That, that we can't pray our way out of. Um, but we should still be handing those burdens over to God. And we should make use of the resources God has given us to pursue peace. And the reason that we can have that peace is because as scripture said, Jesus made peace by the blood of his cross. That Jesus is the Prince of Peace, that he saw the conflict that we had with him and that he came to earth and he did something about it. Um, and that he came and gave his life so that we could have peace with God and peace with each other. Um, and, and this is the beauty of the gospel of Jesus that he invites all of us into. And this is a season when we need to follow a savior who has promised perfect peace and who's already made that peace for us. It's just a matter of us grabbing a hold of it. So that old house I told you about that I was living in, um, things didn't work well in our house that were working against that thermostat working properly. The insulation wasn't good. The ceilings was vaulted, they was too high. Um, there was things that made it hard for the temperature to be right. And, and like that, there's so many things in our world that work against our peace. Uh, the climate is difficult, especially in a season like this, but God has given us a recipe to go after that peace with, with, with God, with him and with one another. And it's this, we should hand our burdens to God. He'll give his peace to us. Uh, my hope is that this pushes us to hand those things to him in prayer. I'm going to pray now. Father, we come in Jesus' name, and we thank you so much for your word, Lord. Now, Father, and we pray um, that in this season of lots of stress and anxiety, that we would take, take to heart what you said to us in your word. Father, I pray for folks right now who are listening who are very stressed and anxious, God. There's a lot going on. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would help us to, to bring those burdens to you not expecting some magic trick to, to not be stressed out immediately, but God, knowing that when we live a life of handing the heavy things to you, uh, that you're more than capable of holding them on your own. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.